strategic plan is the community's vision for the Central Coast for the next 10 years. It's called One Central Coast because this is the first plan for the whole of the Central Coast. We are one region, one council and one community. We live in a special place here on the coast, one in which we want all members of our community to feel valued and have access to a range of opportunities to participate in the richness of community life. And every one of us can play a part in bringing this community vision to life. If people feel part of a community in some way, they'll give without even probably even knowing you're doing it. I wanted to restore this building and get it back to what it was. It was the jewel of the crown and I wanted to get it back to that. Making a difference, I guess that's what we're really here for. The smile on the faces when they see these engines and that bus coming around, they just love it. If you're following what makes you happy and excited and interested, then you're definitely going to live a life that you will be thankful to have lived. At the end of the day, we just had a good idea. We needed the support of many people to turn that great idea into a sustainable venture. My name's Tim Silverwood. I grew up on the Central Coast. It wasn't until I got a bit older and started travelling around the world, I realised that what we had was so special because people don't always treat the environment as well as we do here on the Central Coast. Our programs have focused on going into schools and running events in communities. So we also have a huge global online audience. One man cannot solve these big global problems. It's going to take a tribe of people coming together to solve them. It's a really amazing and rewarding journey in, in spreading this message around the world. I've always been on the coast and I've loved the coast. About six years ago I bought the Chapman building. I, I got the opportunity, I saw that it was for sale and I stood back on the car park up there and a village central and I looked down and you know I could just feel this was the place to be. I could just see what the town was. There's always these little niches that are, you know, going back and forth and, you know, I guess it's an obsession for all of us because we saw what Wyong was like and it's getting it to a place where, you know, we're proud to say we're from Wyong. Like it's become a real proud place to be. My name's Chris Wallace, myself and my wife uh, we own Community Fire Education and the Fun Engine. We educate the community in a different way. We teach people what to do in case of fire. One of the biggest things is, is our education bus. What we do, we go out to different fates, festivals, wherever we can go. When we do the, the bus sometimes, we get 2,000 through that bus. I just enjoy communicating and getting out there and just educating in a different way. I'm Meredith Gilmore. I've lived on the coast since 2000, originally from Sydney. Chose the coast because it's close to Sydney, but it's it's got that more laid back kind of thing that I like. I've, I like living in regional areas. I started visual art in my 40s. It's just so different from what I ever thought that I'd ever do. And it, it is what led me into thinking it would be great to, to talk to people in the arts on the radio. So I started doing some shows, particularly a program called Coast Arts, which was a new show and I reached out into the community because I'm an artist as well. And I just felt like there was a lot of scope on the radio to do interviews with artists and poets and writers and that's been going now for over seven years. My name is Shauna O'Brien. I am from the central coast of New South Wales on dark and young land and I'm a dancer. As an Indigenous dancer, we're very inspired by the environment and where we come from, all of the trees, the way that they curve around all of the rocks and the sea faces, the beautiful water, the fresh air, and that plays a huge part in the creative process. I was lucky enough to study at NASA Dance College, which was a super incredible experience. And the facilities, the studios are really beautiful, the staff are incredible, and I feel very privileged to have had that opportunity. Through volunteering, I was able to meet a bunch of really great other young people in the community that are really passionate about helping other people, and that's a way of taking something that I'm very passionate about and sharing that with other people. No matter where I go to work or uh, if I have to spend a lot of time in Sydney, I always come back to the Central Coast because it feels like home and it helps rejuvenate me. 
One of the things about the Central Coast I've noticed as well, which is people are so helpful to each other. They collaborate, they are interested in going to each other's exhibitions, not just to see what people are doing, but so that there are people there and you've got to be competitive, but you don't have to always be competitive with each other. If you're in a position to make a difference, I guess you're obliged to make that difference, really. Just happy to, you know, give it all I could and it became, you know, a local icon and a buzzing taste of bait.
And tonight we're going to get another report, a three monthly report. Um, for those of you that read the first one, I hope you agree that it was, I achieved my objective of uh, easy to understand. And I've done another one tonight, which I hopefully uh, uh, you share that view. So, again, apologies for being late. I'd like to uh, formally start the meeting by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. Can you hear me up the back, all right? Thank you. The dark and young people on which, uh, whose land we met today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and welcome to this uh, extraordinary meeting uh, of the Central Coast Council. I declare the meeting open. Apologies for moving the council meeting last week. Um, um, I've discussed this with my wife and she's quite happy with me to share it. She, we have a, a little holiday cottage on the south coast of New South Wales. We bought some new beds when the old ones were actually decided to clean at all. And uh, well, I was coming up here for Australia Day and she's never had asthma in her life and they took her to hospital. She could hardly breathe. And they kept her in there for two and a half days while they ran all the tests and she's okay now. Although she's still puffing away on the ventilator. So it's be careful of uh, cleaning up uh, old messes um, when you're not young. But, uh, and to, the, to that website that suggested that I had used that excuse to dodge a demonstration outside the meeting, um, I can't think of what to say. <laughs> Um, the meeting is being webcast, so I'd advise you all to take account of that uh, and be careful if you are speaking uh, and what you say because you, you are liable uh, for defamatory comments and stuff that you, uh, that you say, and particularly now that you've been warned. So please be polite and careful. Uh, please, in the public gallery, remain seated. You know we're still under COVID safe plan. Um, at least we're now having council meetings back in person, which I think most people welcome, and I certainly do and uh, the chamber has been set up to allow for appropriate social distancing. So I'm now going to adjourn the meeting uh, to go to the, uh, the open uh, forum and, and then I'll go to the public forum after that. The open forum is something that I've introduced because you don't have councillors uh, here to represent you and your views, I, and I've done this over the, uh, my, this is my ninth year of administration, uh, I just run an, an open forum so up to eight people can come forward and just raise issues of concern. It doesn't have to be about things that are on the agenda, uh, which is what the public forum uh, is about. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say that we've got seven people uh, tonight, or six people who've put their name down to do so. And the first I'll call is Angela Brewer. Please come up and speak. So the way this works, you've got three minutes. I'm going to have to be a little bit strict tonight because I've used up 20-odd uh, out the front, and uh, so uh, pay attention to the clock occasionally. Um, and uh, after you finish, I'd ask you to vacate the chair so that we can clean it down for the next person, not, that, not, Im not implying that you're going to dirty it, but under COVID rules that's required. And uh, we'll try and give you a response tonight, and if we can't, I'll, I'll get a response to you shortly. So over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Angela Brewer. I have been working as a professional here in Australia, at the Sydney Opera House and overseas for over 25 years. I trained at Melbourne University under consecutive scholarships, completing an honours degree and a thesis on the physiology of singing. I have worked as a conductor and vocal teacher at Melbourne University and at the Central Coast Conservatorium. I am also a resident. I would like to introduce you and the community to Coast Opera Australia. I am the founder and artistic director of the Central Coast's first professional regional opera company. We have an established board of five well-qualified and experienced members that all contribute financially and in skills and expertise. This includes Ms Virginia Henderson, AM, who is our chair, Mr Phil Donnelly, OAM, and our newly appointed Chief Executive Officer, Monique Cardon, which relieves me from those duties, which I'm wrapped. In just two years since establishing COA, we have been listed on the cultural registry as a charity and have been recognised by both state and federal governments with DGR status, deductible gift recipiency. COA has created events in our community to sell out crowds with standing ovations, whilst also presenting intimate performances such as our salute to the Anzacs from the grass of the Central Coast Stadium when COVID hit Sydney. COA 
or Coast Opera Australia, strongly believes that what unites brings vitality, excitement and innovation to a rapidly developing community, it's the arts. That's what the arts are here for. We bring creative thinking, innovation and fresh ideas. So I'd just like to conclude by saying the Australian Bureau of Statistics states that over 11 million people currently attend sporting events. 21 million people currently attend music performances, galleries and creative events. Let me say those figures again. 11 million sporting events, 21 million musical events, galleries, creative events. So by supporting Coast Opera Australia's future endeavours here in Gosford, it will benefit our local businesses, community, students that are here training at the Conservatorium and help us to create a community who appreciate, respect and understand the value of the arts whilst enticing new audiences to the Central Coast for future generations to come. Now, I was going to sing, however, with the COVID restrictions. I move, an, exten I move an extension of time for a minute. For a minute. <laughs> well, on that note then, <clears throat> very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge the relationship Gosford has with its sister city, Edogawa, and it's had this relationship for over 32 years. So without projecting, I'll do a little quick <clears throat> cherry blossom song. Sakura, Sakura, ya yui no sara wa ni wata soka kiri tazu mi ga umoda. Thank you very much. You didn't even ask for any money. <laughs> well, that's probably good because there isn't any. <laughs> uh, I don't have many life regrets, I'm pleased to say, uh, but one of them is that I don't play a musical instrument and uh, I would love to have a gift like, uh, like you have and I'm sure many others enjoyed that, uh, that short performance. So thank you very much, Angela. And the, the council will look to support all the arts groups in the area over time in the, in the way we can and uh, I hope that you find a receptive uh, home here when you when you approach the council uh, to talk about things in the future. Uh, Mr Brett Maltby. Thank you all for your time. Um, as a ratepayer I've never spoken at any events or any council meetings before and, and I was really moved to speak tonight to ensure that everyone here was really aware of the frustration. Um, if you're not already I'm sure you are but uh, I have been uh, wanting to ensure that we can pass that on and um, very disappointed with actions of the public sector and in charge of public funds. And um, uh, in our opinion, myself and my neighbours, we, we're of the opinion that the public sector is not accountable to the same level as the private sector. And if this was a private business, those people would be declared bankrupt if it was their business. And the people running the finances would more than likely be investigated. They'd be charged for operating an insolvent business as the directors, for sure. Absolutely. So, in saying that, we believe that it shouldn't just be fixed with the stroke of a pen. And I'm sure you're doing lots of good work and you've been very public in relation to all your reports. But what I'm requesting is that the administrator appoint a ratepayer representative to sit on the council during the administration period and potentially after. This representative would be there to offer the administration feedback on the, and oversight on the decision making and their thought processes from a ratepayer perspective and not a public servant perspective, which can be a bubble. This would create an openness and add to an openness that currently does not exist. That's all I've got to say. Okay, thank you for coming forward. Um, under the Local Government Act, uh, there's no, there's, please wipe down, there's no provision to allow someone to join the council. Um, uh, interesting idea. Um, when the councils were um, pre-merger, or no, sorry, when they were merged, the councillors of the existing councils were sort of put on the sideline. They weren't actually sacked, although formally they had to be taken out of their jobs. 
but they were put on the sideline and those of us that managed mergers uh, were encouraged to, to involve them in committees and whatever, and that, that worked quite effectively. That's not appropriate in this case, unfortunately. Um, I don't think I feel any lack of connection with the community. I've just been out the front for, uh, for about 40 minutes with about 40 or 50 people who are pretty clear in their frustration and, and uh, we're bombarded with views of people. I also meet with people. Like today I met with the chairman, uh, Mr Edgell, and, and, the, and the CEO of Link Community Housing. Um, and we talked about some ways we might help respond to the homelessness, housing stress situation on the coast. Uh, but I also engage them about the issues that we're dealing with, and I'm, and I'm doing that a lot. So I just encourage you to be confident that uh, we know generally what the community is thinking. You're not a bashful group that hold back from letting, letting it be known what you feel. I can't formally incorporate someone into the council. That, 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 that just doesn't, that does, the Act doesn't allow that. Once the elected body is suspended or sacked, uh, I'm an administrator appointed, and they become the council and has the powers of the council. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that if you go to any of the councils where I've been, you'll find a lot of people who say, in fact, some, some will say there was more democracy when I was there than when, uh, when the councils were there because I listened, I responded, uh, I explained decisions better than they felt they were getting. And I'll continue to try and do that. And thank, and thank you for your acknowledgement of, of the openness. Um, and uh, I'll continue uh, to try and do that. And uh, you'll get this report shortly, and that'll, that'll extend the communication a little bit. But uh, thanks for coming forward. Um, there's one, the, the last message I had, it's in my report, and I gave it to the people outside this message. Um, your under, anger is understandable, uh, but take it to the appropriate place, which is the ballot box. And that, that not only includes voting, it means people considering putting themselves forward. Now, it's not easy on your own, uh, very hard. So you need to form a group of some sort. But someone like yourself, I don't even know anything about you, but clearly the way you present yourself and the way you think, you'd, you'd probably be a, a good person to, to help run the, run the council or to carry out the council side of it uh, in the future. So I think about that. And others who are here tonight, uh, I'd encourage you to do the same. Uh, Mr Blaschke, welcome. I declare that I've worked with uh, Mr Gary Blaschke, how I am, uh, many times in the past, both as Administrator of Warringah Council and Northern Beaches Council. And whenever he used to, he runs Disabled Surfers Association. And if those of you don't know what that they do, uh, they, uh, they give people with quite profound disability a surfing experience. It's beautiful to watch. Uh, they take people out on a board, a, lo a long board obviously, uh, usually two people, uh, they t and they usually surf beaches where there's a flat entry, so you don't get the dumping sort of wave, you just get a rolling wi wide wave. And they turn them around when they get out far enough and put them on a wave. Usually one of them lies behind the person holding to make sure they're safe. And the looks on the faces of the people who are getting a surfing experience uh, will bring you to tears, if, uh, unless you're a, a very hard person. Um, Interestingly, Mr Blaschke has been doing this for decades. He's built a network that goes over Australia uh, and to other countries now. Uh, he's got no personal connection to disability. Usually these sort of things come from a father uh, or a mother or someone who's, who's got it. So uh, whenever he used to come and see me, I used to say to the, the general manager, uh, you, you better be prepared for at least 20,000. I'm seeing Gary Blaschke because <laughs> I could never say no. But you're not here tonight to ask for money, I know. So uh, please talk to us. Oh, no. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Person and officers, for allowing me to speak on a very important yet very neglected topic of disability access and inclusion on the Central Coast itself. Um, as you know, my name's Gary Blasky. I've been an advocate for the disabled for over 35 years. Um, I run several disability organisations, charities, uh, and I've also sat on the first ever Disability Inclusion Reference Group for this council itself. Um, being accessible and inclusive only came about due to the introduction of the Disability Inclusion Act uh, 2014, forcing local governments and others to have an inclusion plan. Um, it was never envisaged to be a tokenistic, feel-good plan or simply ticking the boxes to be seen to be looking after our disabled. 
Yet I personally have conducted access audits for several of the council's facilities, such as Canton Holiday Park, Budgie Holiday Park, and several beaches, plus private venues like Lake Haven Shopping Centre and the Caltech service stations on the M1 um, freeway. Not uh, many of uh, those audits actually failed. There wasn't, very few of them had everything that we needed for movement or living on the central coast with a disability or even an ageing uh, issue. So there's a whole series, there, there's disability, there's mobility and there's also ageing issues. Can I ask you to give it like a score out of 10? I mean, how badly did they fail? Was it a... Uh, pretty, pretty badly. I suspect like you're a pretty cases. hard marker. Well, I am because I look at it from a, a living perspective. You know, I, I want to know that my 94-year-old mother can walk down the street without tripping over. I want to know that my mates who have got cerebral palsy uh, are going to be able to get into shops or... So the, the, the crosses that you might have given, were you assessed they, those things might be at risk? Or no, not, not the, these are pretty blatant things yeah, like that's no what I mean, disabled yeah, okay. parking and all okay. that sort of stuff. Uh, go on. Yep. Look, we have a, a population getting close to 374,000 um, people. Statistically, 18% of that have a disability, that being potentially some 67,000 people on the coast who have a disability or mobility oh. issue. One in three of those, that's 32%, have a severe or profound disability. Two in five, that's 38%, have difficulty accessing buildings, let alone strip shopping centres, parks, beaches or transport. So, you know, this ageing population that we have, we're the third largest ageing population in New South Wales. So we seriously have to look at it. We now have the NDIS program going where... I've interrupted you and used up some of your time. Would you like a short extension? I could, thanks. Thank you, yes. um, We have the NDIS now, which is allowing people with disabilities to get out and, and see the world a little bit easier. But it's no good getting out if you can't get in. Uh, if you can't get can, into a Can I ask you, with your remaining minute, can I ask you what you want me to do? Well, I'm just saying that we need to seriously look at it. We have very limited disabled parking spots in a lot of the areas, uh, poor or non-suitable amenities blocks, um, trip hazards on our footpaths, minimal access to restaurants and that. And a good example, I told you to go up and have a look at Caves Beach at their amenity up there. And their amenity for disabled is because we, we sat down and spoke with them. Um, they came up with probably the well. best amenity in New South Wales. Um, yet, you know, we, we have even Breakaway on the coast. And Breakaway is a world-class disability organisation that can't even get their name on council's website. Uh, they've been there for 37 years and do a marvellous job. Uh, but unless we get rid of the tokenistic approach towards uh, uh, disability and inclusion and seriously look outside of the square, um, we have simply failed okay. as a community. All right. I have to ask you to, to, to wind up, but thank you for that. I'm, I'm, this is not the end of it. If you go back to your chair, I'll, I'll make a few comments and ask Ms Vaughan to respond. Thank you. Um, I, I, I won't accept that the council's approach is tokenistic, but I would accept that we could always do better. And, uh, and I, believe, uh, I believe you are a hard marker and I think that's good. And I think it's good that someone's there to keep pressure on everyone involved. There is a, a currently a newly formed disability advisory committee. I, I spoke to them at their first meeting uh, virtually and encouraged them to bring forward any issues that I, they might have during my time that I could possibly deal with. I have met with Mr Blaschke recently and in fact encouraged him to, to come here tonight. Um, you need to turn your broad things into some narrow focus. Uh, with some issues that we might uh, we might focus on, and uh, but, I, but given what you said, I'd invite uh, the Director Julie Vaughan to make any comment. Thank you, Mr. Administrator, and um, of course, thank you, Mr. Blasky, again for your ongoing commitment and um, the work that you've done for our region. And you are correct; you were uh, an important part of our inaugural um, disability inclusion action plan advisory group. So, I'm pleased to say we're in the final year of. Um, completing the actions for that of a four-year plan. And we've just commenced, as the Administrator says, um, developing our next um, Disability Inclusion Action Plan with a new group of advisory committee members and made up of community and um, people that are living with
with a um, disability as well. Um, just some of the key um, achievements, um, as you say, there's a lot of issues to address in this um, arena and um, we have, I believe, um, undertaken and achieved a lot but still a long way to go. So in the last four years there's been 75 um, audits that have been undertaken on council facilities, um, community and recreation facilities and um, that's allowed us to address um, accessibility issues for all people. Um, we've been able to enhance our dis disability wheelchair accesses um, and provision of equipment at beaches, so we now have 23 wheelchairs available for the community, um, and we have three beaches across the region um, that uh, class is accessible due to the beach mat matting that we've been able to provide. In relation to play spaces, we've been able to upgrade 26 local play, play spaces, um, and our recreation planner actually sits on the New South Wales Government Everyone Can Play advisory group. So we do believe that we're moving in the right direction to address um, some improvements both for our facilities and our recreation um, facilities. Um, Mr Blasky is correct that education, awareness and inclusion is um, paramount on this particular issue and um, will be a key continued focus both with community and businesses across the region. Um, and I'm pleased to say we're, uh, we're just finalising our um, four identified town centres that have been um, key places and spaces to explore opportunities from a disability tourism precinct um, focus. So um, there'll be more work in that, in that arena and audits have been undertaken to identify opportunities um, because that has certainly been identified as a key opportunity in our tourism opportunity plan as well. But yet again, um, like you, Mr Administrator, I'd like to thank Gary for his ongoing commitment to um, a very important cause for our community. Thank you very much. Um, I think probably what I would enjoy is if we uh, arrange a time to, meet, to get together and, and visit a couple of sites where you can demonstrate to me where what council thinks acceptable isn't to you and why it isn't and we'll have a bit of a, a, a real site visit there and, and talk that through. So if you contact my office uh, and we'll arrange a, a mutually convenient time. Thank you for raising issues with me. Um, Joy Cooper. Welcome. Uh, Administrator Person, I wanted to speak to you about the uh, use of public land by council. Um, specifically, uh, one is um, RE1 land um, that um, is being used for um, storing uh, construction materials, gravel and the like, um, and also uh, we have private um, folk that are using public land for their own businesses. Um, the two areas that have come to my attention in regard to the um, council is in Springfield, just off Emma James Street. Um, it has a reserve on one side and it's signposted as such, and on the other side there's a, a dog walking area. It is only one large lot of land where the dog walking area is and there's tons and tons, tons of, of gravel and um, concrete um, culverts that are being stored there. Um, I'm sure that it was calculated as um, a residential recreation in, in measuring adequate space. How um, long has it been there? Uh, I've, I've lived in that area from 1982. I can't tell you. It's actually hidden and tucked away, so it's hard to see. You don't If you drive past, you don't even notice. It's in a little valley where there's a creek that if runs it, through. If it's tucked away and you don't notice, why are you here? Because it needs to be a space that's available for people for green space, either trees, oh, but not okay. to be hidden to be used for, for activities with the council. Um, the, uh, so that's in um, Springfield, and I have the permission of the... Um, of Gail Santi from the Springfield Residents Association. I've spoken to her about that. She's also concerned. Um, in Green Point, there was a, a road, um, Dalgetty Crescent. It was relocated. Either side it had um, RE1 land. It was very close to where they put in a roundabout and they moved the uh, road away from the roundabout so there was more of a T intersection rather than going in. Um, so we lost some of our um, green space there and the area where the old road is, is still being used well after the roundabout's finished to store materials there. And there's, there's gravel and soil and rocks and machinery okay, that's being you. stored there. Yep. Um, now, the other, other two are um, 
in George Street in East Gosford that is RE1 and it's a, a, a wedge that's been cut off as a um, and it's been used for a, as a private business um, and it, it, it is actually a, a park or reserve um, that's in George Street East Gosford on the sweeping bend just before you go to the Punt Bridge um, and on the corner of Avoca Drive and Central Coast Highway there's an area that the council maintain and trim the hedges and um, do the gardens it used to be uh, blocked off so no one could park there, but it was a green space. Now it's actually, and it has for a number of years, been used for a business to store their utes and trucks and um, firewood and whatever else. It's just this continual <coughs> loss of open green space, whether it be used for people or whether they can see it or not, it should be there mm. available for use if so okay. desired. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bolgoff, do you have any information about the issues raised by English, as you indicated, and I think that it has given uh, residents uh, a very good insight into what's been going on. Unfortunately, they haven't really, uh, none of us have been, had that insight in the past. You stated there that uh, this is a story about the failure of a council to understand or practice the basics of sound financial management. In that report, that budget mismanagement and the use of restricted funds either unlawful or without the approval of the council. Um, you have also stated publicly in the press that uh, ratepayers are de facto shareholders and as such are responsible to repay the council debts through increased rates. Uh, I, I must say I, I disagree with that. Well, I, that's not an accurate quote of what I said, but no, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that when you finish. I, yes, well, I didn't sorry, say, I didn't say what you just said, but anyway. Yes, but... Um, there's but some you, truth in what you said. Yes, but you're more or less saying that there's no one else to pay. That is true, yes. yes so, I certainly and, said that. Yes, mm. so, uh, and that is the, the point that I wish to make. Um, it's well known that professionals such as lawyers and doctors are required by law to have professional indemnity insurance. Uh, my question is... Do any of the councillors or the mayor or the senior officers of the council, senior accountants uh, and government and private auditors have professional indemnity insurance? And if so, have you, uh, Mr Person, or the council's legal department uh, been considering this option in light of the financial mess the council is in? Uh, in the event that these officers do not have such insurance, um, shouldn't there be a legal requirement uh, for these these officers and councillors to have this protection, to protect uh, pr protection for themselves and also for ratepayers, to protect ratepayers from any negligent actions or malfeasance that may may occur. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll make a few uh, comments in response. Um, where to start? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, there, there's no provisions of the Local Government Act. Uh, well, there is a provision to surcharge um, people under a section of the Act. Uh, that's never been used and it's quite would be quite difficult to do. Um, there isn't, if there was evidence of corruption here, uh, that action, some action would be certainly taken. Um, in terms of the uh, issue of competence, the Minister formed the view that the Council should be suspended uh, because it, it, this Council actually went to the government and said, we can't pay our staff. Now, no one's ever heard of that happening. So we're not talking about, I mean, some of you run businesses, but everyone understands that cash is really important and all of the Council meetings I've attended over, an, over a nine year period, there's a monthly report which talks about cash and whatever. So I don't understand how you get to a point where you can't pay your bill you know, within a matter of weeks. The Minister used one of the powers available to her, which was to suspend the Council immediately and put in someone, uh, well, in, the, in this case, they put in a team. I, I mean, I'm the Council and Mr Hart came with me as, to be the General Manager and I quickly assessed that the previous uh, Chief Executive or General Manager uh, hadn't met their responsibilities adequately and moved him on. I, I regret having to use that expensive provision of the of the um, uh, contract, which resulted in a, a, an outrageously large payout in my view. Uh, but I, I did form the view and the balance of options open to me. The most important thing was to get a new chief executive in here. Uh, and there's a lead time in recruitment, as you'd understand, because I'm only going to appoint someone who's running, uh, or has run a, a large organisation and is more than likely employed. So if you look at the lead times, uh, they, they're all, and unfortunately the previous council uh, had given uh, the, that general manager a, a, a satisfactory mark, which was like the middle of the range, but satisfactory on the two previous performance audits. And that meant uh, that I would have had a great deal of difficulty legally uh, establishing a performance issue or had to have an inquiry and that would have rolled on in time. So I apologise again and again for that because I, I didn't, want, didn't want to do that, but I felt that in the balance the most important thing was to get a new a senior person here in place to get things sorted out. Uh, your views about uh, whether or not people can be held responsible, I mean, it's a bit like uh, that doesn't apply to other levels of government, like the, the federal government, there's no provision if the, if the government loses a lot of money, but it has a taxing power uh, and it can get its way out of its problems. Uh, state government's the same, there's no provision to go after the cabinet if they run over their budget for a local council because it has a taxing power and it can deal with the situation. As I said earlier on, it, the place to be angry is at the ballot box. But there's no one else to pay uh, the piper here. We have to deal with our own situation. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this shortly and I'll, so I won't go into it now. But we have cut costs as much as we think they can be cut. About 70% of the, the hole we have to fill is going to be done from cutting, spending less, uh, but we are of the view that it can't go deeper than that without irreparably damaging the organisation. The 15% wage increase, which uh, I support in, in certainly in principle, um, raises about 26 million of the 70 a year we have to you know, turn around. So uh, I, don't, I don't think there's an alternative, personally, and I think those people who spend the time coming to grips with the situation would share that view. Um, we had to borrow money. Uh, the banks wouldn't have lent it to us if we hadn't shown that we were going to cut costs, save money, sell assets, raise revenue. Uh, if we hadn't got that $100 million loan just prior to Christmas, we wouldn't have paid, been able to pay our staff again or our creditors in January. And I think some people lose probably just lose sight of the, the enormity of the problem that we're in rather than... So uh, rate increases, no, no one wants them, I don't want them, but uh, I believe the, of the options open, it's probably the most responsible one to take. So I have a huge communication challenge. I went out the front, tried to turn around 50 people. I got a, an extended uh, applause when I left, but I think that was for turning up <laughs> rather than uh, for persuading them uh, any different. But. Uh, but no, I don't think there's a way of doing things the way you're talking about. I tried to make the analogy with the, with the shareholders um, because someone said to me, you know, they actually said, well, I, I run a business and, and if I lose money, I don't charge my clients. 
And I said to her, well, you're, not, you're a client of the council when you go to the library, but you're not actually a client in this situation. You're actually more like a shareholder in this situation. And so I tried to extend that analogy. It was hugely unsuccessful uh, with a lot of people. But uh, the equivalent in, the, in, the, in, the, in a company situation, if you're not happy with the company's the director's performance, you go to an AGM and vote them out. And that's, this, that, that's the situation that's available. That's the, that's the parallel here with an election with the councillors. That's your chance to have your say on their performance there. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll try and do better with my uh, metaphors and analogies. Um, Greg Best, former councillor. Good afternoon. Good evening. Rick. Dick, Ms Corning, fifth, the fifth CEO, the fifth in two years. I wish you well. Um, look, thank you for coming out last uh, this afternoon and speaking to the community. Uh, it wouldn't surprise you that after 25 years of representing my community here as an independent, um, a lot of people have contacted me over <coughs> the survey. That's that's the SRV survey, Rick, that's been created and. You know, I'm not going to sit here and start lecturing because I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes. If you make that many decisions over 25 years, you're going to make mistakes. It's just the way it is. I've been through SRVs in the past and, and how much pain they generate. And I've sat in your seat trying to decide, you know, vexed as to whether we implement the SRV and why or we go at where we sat at the time. <sighs> I'm not going to criticise the document. You know, there are some things... You cannot. I did. Well, no, you can criticise it. Well, no, it's not precious. Well, well, not pre question seven of the document. Um, you can't go forward with the asterisk till eight to get to the zero rate rise until you answer, you know, as you said out the front, you know, it's going to be reported. But people perceive that to be a little, a little tricky. And, and, and you've got to hold the confidence of the community. And they're coming to me in droves saying, you know, this is a fait accompli. Um, look, I know the team sitting around here and how difficult it is for everyone, and I look into the document further on into here, um, you know, where you're going to be looking to strip out more than 500 staff eventually, um, and you do say in your document, under 2,000. I mean, when the council was amalgamated, we had around 2,050, 2,075 1,750? Amalgamated? Hmm. The two joined. Hmm. Well, we were reported at just over 2,000, so no, correct no. me. I mean, that's that's the story. So we're really possibly net 700 up on where we should be, which is about $50 million roundy round, you know. And, and this is very painful because many of the staff in this business I've known for a very long time, some of my friends and they're great acquaintances and they do a wonderful job. I pleaded in this room, and I've not come to cry here, but I've pleaded in this very room back 2018, you've got to right side this. You've got to go for natural attrition. You've got to avoid redundancies. And I sit here now extremely vexed in my emotion, sitting in this room. My seat used to be right there. And, and I do this with, you know, a little bit of my heart on my sleeve tonight. But I'm not here to lecture. I'm here to remind you what that lady said about Budgie Oi and how there are a lot of people up north that are really doing it tough. And if there is any way to cut the cloth further, and I fully get it that, you know, there is just so much of the pie you can cut until you're starved to death. I hear you, gentlemen. But, you know, you I've got a lot of mates on the northern beaches. So I've done my homework. You guys scrub up down there. You know, you do. And I'm not just giving you, you know, smoke there. You do. But here, the numbers, the people at home are really, really doing the numbers tough. You, you hear Gary speak about the disability issue and the numbers of people. That equates to the wallet as well, those kinds of individuals who are challenged. And I know there is a respite. I, I, look, we've run out of time, but I have to say, while well, you're in the chair, you put up the rates in Wyong as a yes. Wyong councillor. Yes. And where was the concern about the people doing it tough then? That's a really good question, Dick, and, and, and I've been asked that of many people in the past. I'm sure. And, and that is, again, the advice as the board receives from the bureaucracy about the options we're facing. It's either you get shot in the head once or twice. What do you want? And and that's pretty well the situation you're sitting in now. You're so now were, in my chair. So were the people doing it tough? Uh, how did it affect them? Yes, and, and, and with hindsight, and we're all sitting here with 2020 rear vision mirrors, and I've got one too. I'm not perfect. But I had my time again. 
I would not have put in such a drastic, extraordinary rate rise mm. in wine. Okay. Look, That's the you, truth of it. Your time's up. Thanks well, thank for raising you your, raising your concerns. And, uh, and no thank doubt you for we'll, coming out tonight. Thank you. No doubt we'll talk again. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the overall financial situation in a few minutes. So I'll save some of my uh, things that I might have otherwise said uh, to Mr Best until I get to, to that point. But thank you for, for coming forward. Um, uh, Mr Chestnut, welcome. Mr Chestnut's a former senior planning official from the former Gosford Council. Welcome. That's correct. Thank you. Well, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address the meeting. I sit before you this evening to wish to share with you the following. Firstly, I wish to publicly thank you for meeting with representatives, representatives of the Community Environmental Network on Thursday the 17th of December 2020, along with Scott Cox, Director of Environment and Planning, to discuss the report titled Strengths, Weaknesses, Challenges and Opportunities of the Coastal Open Space System. Um, Mr Pearson and Mr Cox, you no doubt recall that the meeting we explained that prior to the releasing of the report publicly, it was the Community Environmental Network's intention to inform all local politicians and key community representatives about the report. In this regard, prior to our meeting, we informed you that meetings have already been held with the State Member for Wyong, David Harris, MP, the State Member for Gosford, Ms Leisha Tish, MP, and the Member for the Greens, Ms Abigail Boyle, MLC. Since our meeting, we have now scheduled and confirmed meetings with the Parliamentary Secretary, James Griffin, from New South Wales Ministry for Environment, Energy and Science, and the Honourable Matthew Keane, MP, and the State Member for the Entrance, Mr David Meehan, MP. When are those meetings? Tomorrow. Okay. I'd encourage you to talk to Mr Ryan. Where is Mr Ryan? Oh, down here. Thank you. Where am I right? Um, after he speaks, I might encourage you to have a chat outside uh, just to get the benefit of his advice about some of his views. I know you're also a technician of, of, of long-standing experience, but he's also dealing with it at the moment. And if... if, if Given that meeting is tomorrow, it's probably good for you to have a quick chat. I look forward to it. Okay, I'll just carry on if yep. I may. Uh, CNN is currently in the process of arranging meetings with members of the Liberal Party, Mr Taylor Martin, MLC, the State Member for Terrigal, Mr Adam Crouch, MP, and the Shadow Minister of Environment and Heritage, Ms Kate Washington, MP. A formal request for an email has also been forwarded to Mr Rick Hart, Acting Chief Executive Officer, to allow CEN to give the same PowerPoint presentation to you and Mr Scott to a future Coastal Open Space Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, this brings me to the second reason for my presentation. Subject to all local politicians having received the report and Mr Hart agreeing to a presentation at the future COS Advisory Committee meeting, CEN would like to arrange for a public release of the report. As, as shared with you in our presentation at this COS was the initiative of the senior management of the former Gosford City Council and as the Central Coast, Central Coast Council now takes responsibility for the future of COS, CNN would like to invite you and the executive leadership team of Council to participate in the release of the public report. CN therefore seeks your view on whether or not you or your executive leadership team would like to participate in the public release of the report. In arranging for the public re release of the report, it would be advantageous to have a response to the letter presented to you at the conclusion of our meeting. Thanks for the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the answer is yes, I'd be happy to participate in the release of the report. Thank you. And uh, can I suggest you and Mr Ryan have a quick chat? Um, I look forward to that. Okay. Um, I support the, the, uh, the cost lands. Um, everyone, put your hand up if you're not aware of the cost lands. I presume you all are. Okay. One, one two. Um, the cost lands are this, is this wonderful legacy that you've inherited with, uh, with the, the hilltop lands through Gosford not being developed. Uh, and that forms a network of green space, which is valued by most who know about it. Um, and you might think that that was created because someone had a vision for keeping development off the hilltops and being a lovely green space. I found out, I think from yourself, uh, that it was actually the, an engineer from Gosford, and at that time most engineers weren't actually very green at all, uh, worked out that it was expensive to pump water to the top of the hills so they wouldn't allow development up there because it was too expensive to, to pump, put the services on. So it's remained green. So it didn't actually come out of an environmental vision at all. It came out of a, a, a conservative sort of cost. Anyway, I just think there's a wonderful irony. But nevertheless, it's there, and that's the important thing. 
I personally uh, would like to see it extended into the Wyong area, and I'm going to work with you uh, and through Mr Ryan to see what we can do. There are some state government issues, uh, and that's why I just want to make sure you're both on the same page before your meeting uh, tomorrow. Okay, so that finishes the open forum. Um, thank you for those who've come forward. I now uh, declare open, a res we, re we resume the formal council meeting and I declare open the public forum. This is a forum where people who want to speak on the different items on the agenda uh, can put their name down to, to speak. Uh, the way this has been run uh, is in the past is that they all speak at the beginning of the meeting, even though the issues may be scattered through the agenda. Uh, and that makes sense in a council situation where there's 15, uh, 15 councillors who represent the community who are probably going to speak on those issues. But even that they're not here, I, I'm going to propose, and I'm asking the staff for the next meetings or as soon as possible, to line up the speaker before the item so that we don't have this gap where people are trying to remember what did they say and how did that relate to the, to the item. So it's a small procedural change, but it works better uh, with the council under administration. But um, uh, Mr Chestnut, I should have got you to stay in the chair because you're uh, first up to speak about the Chain Valley Colliery Delta Coal Community Funding Program. Thank you. Um, thanks for allowing me to discuss this item on the item number two. 2.2. On the form to speak at the public forum, you're required to state whether you're against or the, against the public recommendation. I'm not against the recommendation, however, I have a series of questions to present to you prior to that adoption of that recommendation. My first question is, can a voluntary planning agreement be confidential? The reason for asking this question is because on page 13 or 15, depending upon what council business paper you look, it states the Chain Valley Community Funding Program was established between Delta Coal Proprietary Limited, formerly Lake, Lake Coal Proprietary Limited, and Central Coast Council as part of a voluntary planning agreement. Can I cut across to save time? I read that, couldn't believe that. I've checked and it won't be confidential, nor should they be, nor will any others. Well, I won't. They'll be on a list of public register. Okay, then yeah. I won't proceed any further because that's really yeah. what my no, question is all totally, about. I totally, totally not. We're not quite sure how why that happened there, but that's not the intention and, and it shouldn't be and it won't be. Okay, thank you. But thank you for raising it and it's good to have people in the community keeping an eye on things and I applaud you for that. Thanks. Uh, Marianne Hamilton. Sorry, we just wait for us to get a little clean up here. I'm very Welcome. nervous. <laughs> I've never, I've never done this before. Um, my name's Marianne Hamilton and I'm a resident and rate payer. I haven't bitten anyone for at least a oh, year, <laughs> so don't worry. That's a relief. Yeah. Um, my name's Marianne Hamilton and I've lived on the coast for um, a good 25 years. Um, and um, I have some general questions mostly about the business recovery, recovery plan. Um, so to the administrator, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And thank you, Mr. Person, for the work you have done thus far with the council. Um, some of my questions are, council are to receive a report on financial position every fortnight now. Um, this was decided on the 26th of the 10th. Is this on track? Mm -hmm. That's my first one. Um, I'm just going to add another little bit because of the previous speaker. What really also concerns me is the number of confidential meetings that have been held and are still being held that the public knows zero about and can't find, you know, information about. So I'm just throwing that one in. Um, on the 18th of the 12th, um, you received a 100, uh, 100 million tranche of commercial credit. Now, as we all know, tranche is a slice. What was the total amount? Um, loan from one of the big four, which one? Maybe other people know, I don't. Um, so I'll just go down a little bit more. 2.4, the forensic audit. Um, you're employing yet another forensic accountant. How many is that so far? Presumably ratepayers are paying for all these audits with no revelation of the true situation, just from our point of view or my point of view and many others as well. Um, you're also conducting a workforce review. Um, what I'd really like to know is what is the breakdown of middle and senior management positions to workers at the coalface? And will these essential positions be maintained or culled? Um, that, the first part of that, the middle and senior management, 
uh, always concerns me because there are an awful lot of... I'm just looking tonight. Chief Financial Officer, Chief Operating Officer, Administrator, uh, Acting Chief Executive Officer, Executive, um, and then we've got the missing one that was fired, I think. Well, he's missing, so he doesn't count. <laughs> you can't count the ones that are gone. What was he? Yeah. I, can't, I just can't even think of the title. Chief, um, Chief Executive Officer. Sorry? Chief Executive Officer is Yeah, gone Chief now. Executive Officer, and I wonder what's that's the difference. And an example of outsourcing that the council has been engaging in, I noticed um, when I tried to attend a meeting back in December, Eventbrite has been engaged to organise public meetings. Is this just because of COVID or is it um, a, a regular thing? Because it seems to me that organising numbers and writing down some names, especially in this situation, could be accomplished by the most junior staff or even an intern. Um, and overall, um, what has been achieved to the 31st of January? And I guess you're going to tell us tonight. I can. Thank you very <laughs> That's much. That's it. <laughs> Thank um, you. In terms of general advice, um, some people choose to provide a bit of a submission of what they're going to raise, and that helps get an answer, uh, particularly when you're going to raise lots of individual questions. So uh, we're probably not in a position to, to answer all, but I, I think Ms Cowley can probably take most of them on on directly, but the, the, the short answer is there will be not much going in a confidential session while I'm here, but there are, there are in a lot of items to do with tenders, for example, uh, there's information from the losing tenderers that, that can't be revealed. Uh, so there is commercial, there's real commercial in confidence matters that come before the council and uh, I only uh, will support it being used very sparingly. Uh, but, it, but I can assure you there is a genuine need for some of it. Thank you, Mr. Administrator, and thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Um, I will go through, through some of your questions. Um, is the financial position reported on a fortnightly basis? Yes, it is. Um, it is actually called the Business Recovery Plan. Um, we report that every two weeks. Um, it is um, number three point one in the agenda in this agenda and, and there is a section that is called financial position right at the beginning and the purpose of that report is specifically to give uh, uh, an out uh, uh, an overview of what we've done specifically against that business recovery plan um, there is obviously another financial position which is part of the financial statements that we report on an annual basis but that's um, that's that's a different document so for the purposes of this situation we report uh, we, we report this your second question was about uh, the $100 million, and is that another tranche, three tranches, or how many tranches? Um, yes, so there were two um, tranches. Um, it was the $50 million loan that, that occurred in November, and then um, that was originally budgeted, and it was um, explained to uh, council and adopted by council at the beginning of the year, um, and then we needed $100 million. So that finalises all of our tranches. Now, in terms of... Which bank is it? Um, look, I can, um, uh, unfortunately, there, there's not many things that we'd like to um, keep concealed, but in this case, um, we have got four major players. So I can confirm that it's one of the four major players, uh, but what happens is when the banks come and bid for a loan, um, and when it is a huge loan like that, they often don't want to disclose to the other the other counterparts that they've been the one that have given the loan in order to see what the um, what the um, banking interest rate is. So we're not the ones wanting to conceal that information. We've actually been asked by the banks not to disclose that. So that is the reason why that that has occurred. Can I just add to that? Uh, we're only allowed to deal with the big four. We don't, we're not allowed to go down to lower or higher risk banks, lower down the order. So that, that is an assurance that the community has that we're dealing with top tier banks that, are, that themselves are virtually guaranteed by the government. So there, there isn't risk for you there. Um, in terms of the forensic forensic audit question that you asked, yes, and that's a fair question. Um, it does, uh, I think, in the current situation where we've had um, as many financial issues as one could ever ever um, have in, a, in an environment like this, um, there is a sense of requirement to 
do that. Um, we have been very um, deliberate in what it is that we ask them to do and what it is that we expect to get out of the exercise. Um, we have been very conscious of costs and the costs that the community uh, are bearing. Um, all of our costs are in accordance with our procurement practices. We are very tight around this. Um, I have um, and will provide an update on the forensic audit. It hasn't completed. It hasn't been completed and that's why there is no, no outcome yet. But once uh, there is an outcome, we will share that. Um, we're definitely transparent in that matter. Um, in terms of the workforce review, um, I won't uh, steal uh, Mr. Administrator's uh, thunder, so he'll, he'll discuss uh, some of those findings in his report that he will table uh, tonight. But uh, rest assured that in terms of at the highest level, um, we've removed, uh, we've started with 10 people at the executives. We are down to five, so we've reduced 50% of that. And in terms of then um, middle, man middle management, we've reduced 30% of that. We have been very, very conscious of ensuring that um, it, that the, um, the 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 ground force and action and, and our engine room. Uh, remains as as tight as what it needs to be. Um, so uh, that has been uh, the impact that we've had. Um, in terms of what has been achieved, um, you will uh, you will um, hear that directly from uh, Mr. Administrator. He will uh, provide that tonight. And in terms of outsourcing, your your final question and the event bright. Um, Look, we take that that uh, that on board, um, and your feedback. I can I can confirm that all of our costs and the way that we resource everything um, um, has been as tightly controlled as possible. We've actually slashed 10% of our entire um, materials and contracts um, uh, uh, costs. And um, if we if we do do something, it's probably because uh, we, we, we absolutely ensure that outsourcing is not the first thing that, that we do. Um, we definitely, um, that's not something that we, 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 we go to as a first um, um, outcome. But um, if, if it has been a little bit cheaper, it's probably the reason why we've We've so done it. Was event, is event bright um, just been because of COVID? Um, yes, it has been because can of COVID. Can extend yes. to engage in a dialogue across, but, yeah. but but we'll be available to talk after the meeting if you've got that much patience to sit, sit through another probably an hour and a quarter, I suspect, of meeting. You're welcome to stay and raise other issues. Thank you. And it does appear that you did supply a list of questions. Um, no, I just oh, you, oh, well, well done if you responded off the top. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chestnut, you're back again. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. Um, there is, I won't take much time. You're on allowed this. Two, two items. I'm told the rules say you can speak on two different items on the agenda. So you, really, I you, didn't know you're that. within Thank the you. rules. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me informing on that. I'm, not a, I'm actually speaking on item 3.3, .3, titled Meeting Records of Advisory Group and Committee Meetings, held on the November, December 2020. I'm not against the recommendation. However, contained within the report is a statement that meeting records will also no longer be included as attachment to council reports unless specifically required. Links to the meeting records on council's website will instead be included in, in reports executive summary as in this report. With all due respect, although it's not a recommendation, I do not agree with this approach in that I believe for openness and transparency that meeting records from advisory group and committee meetings should be reported to council in full, which has been standard practice rather than provided as a link. Although the minutes of the meeting can be viewed using the link, it is not as simple as opening up the one council business paper and skim reading the entire report. For example, if you take the time to open the link to the Gosford CPD, it actually states that in, uh, nearly in, in that report, noted that early concept plans for the Leagues Club field site showed a significant amount of established trees, but current amount is much less than expected, when it which is disappointing. Further, concerns raised about performing outside and cost of council chambers being considered for sale as part of response to council's current financial situation, given the implications for Gosford CBD, such as economic benefit gain from people occupying these sites. Although these are recorded as information and no action, it's important to note the concerns of the community that actually participate in those advisory group meetings and the fact that the Lease Club field upgrade is not proceeding in accordance with what was originally advertised. Likewise, if you take the opportunity to open the link to the Coastal Open Space System Committee on the 1st of December, it talks about there that the advisory group discussed the council resolution of the 30th of November. 
in regard to the sale of land at Thompson Vale Road, Doylson. The advisory group members expressed their concern regarding the sale of these lands and the action of council staff to provide additional information to advisory group members on Thompson Vale Road, Doylson, that has been listed for sale and circulated on the 30th of November council relating to this matter. And a second action, relevant unit manager be invited to the next meeting to ad address advisory group members' concerns relating to the sale of land at Thompson Vale Road, Doylson. Now, as Thompson Vale Road, Doylson is an environmentally sensitive land, the question, this, this concern is actually hidden in a link rather than being in the open business paper. To ensure that council is viewed as open and transparent, may I suggest that you consider an additional recommendation to the current report that council staff maintain the current meeting records for advisory group and committee meetings be reported to council in full and not accessed via an electronic okay. link. Thank you Thanks. very much. Uh, Ms Cowley. Uh, thank you for the feedback, Mr Chestnut. Really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of context as to why um, we have made, made, made the change. Um, there is no intent at all to deceive the community or conceal some of that information. In fact, um, as you may be aware, council is in the process of um, restructuring and doing um, and reducing some costs. So um, with a situation where we've got 82 pages across 15 different meetings, all of which are hyperlinked, available around our, our website, the, the resources that, that are required from an administrative point of view, it would take seven hours to prepare the 15 reports on an individual basis um, in order to actually format all the different pages in, and allow them um, to, be, to be put together. So um, from, a, um, from a resourcing point of view, um, um, we would, we would uh, appreciate the opportunity to continue on the hyperlinked um, approach, we can absolutely confirm and um, we, we would guarantee that if there is a council action that will be required, that would be brought as a separate uh, report and there would be the appropriate transparency and visibility to the community for that. Um, but in terms of uh, what happens in the minutes of meetings, they will be available, they will be with a hyperlink, they will be available on the website, anyone can have a look at it, appreciate it that it might be a little bit more problematic that it won't allow you the scheme reading opportunity to um, go through those documents. Documents, uh, but the information will be will be there. So, as long as it's okay, we'll we would like to uh, proceed okay. with the. I um, I um, I value your public service, so I uh, will undertake to get Miss Cowley to demonstrate to me how that system works uh, to satisfy myself. I, I mean, both Mr. Ryan and Miss Cowley uh, advise me they think it's fine and that there's no concealment but I will spend um, a short amount of time, probably half an hour for a meeting where you just demonstrate to me how, how it's there. But there's certainly no intention to conceal. But in the current climate, I, I have to say, I, as long as there's no concealment, I support efficiency measures. Uh, we need them a lot. Uh, Mr Hughes. Welcome. Hi. Um, Mr. Person, firstly, thank you for coming to the helm. I, as, a, as a resident, I appreciate you being here. And um, hi to your officers and hi to everyone else. And also, uh, a personal thanks for looking after Warringah some years ago as well. That was appreciated too. Uh, <clears throat> so my name's Barry Hughes and I'm here with my wife, Joanna. And we are residents of Kingcumber and we spent two and a half years looking for our home, for our children and ourselves. From Gympie all the way down to Sussex Inlet and Huskisson. Can I get you to line up with the microphone just a bit better? No, don't bring it closer, just move your chair. Thank you very much, I think that'll be better. And we decided on Kingcumber, and we love Kingcumber. It's central and it's a great location. And we purchased there 13, 12 to 13 years ago. And we're going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about the tip, Kingcumber tip. And we purchased knowing that the tip was going to close as a putrescible waste dump. Um, and we took that risk. And we, when the tip did close and became a transfer station, we celebrated knowing that we'd made the right decision. And all of our neighbours celebrated as well because obviously there were some issues that were now gone. Um, 
Now, I had my own business when we moved up here. I had, I'm a qualified horticulturalist with some 30 years experience and I was operating out of the northern beaches and also starting a business on, in, in the, on the central coast. And I was using the transfer station a lot. And when it closed, I got a bit of a shock. Um, I've since moved out of that business, but that shock's over now because I've adapted. We use council cleanups, I take my waste to Woi Woi, and I've gotten used to it. And also, if we have a really big issue, we can hire a bin and get it taken away. So we, my wife and I, we are for the closure of the tip, the permanent closure of King Cumberland Bull. The council has had access to the site since, I believe, 1958. And then, I believe, from 1977, it was taken over as a, as a, as a waste dump. It's really been my experience that You've only got a short time left. I apologise. So landfills, landfills become the domain of the public once they're finished with. And we are for the closure of it, and we are also against any other development other than for use of the, by the residents. So, for example, under point four of the report supporting item 5.2, we are very definitely against the development of a soil and aggregate resource recovery facility. I have deep concerns about an, a facility like that uh, being used on that site. Um, I do believe the time has come for it to be passed back to the residents in a form of... Um, Can you explain briefly what your concerns would be for that use? Uh, primarily dusts, all sorts of noxious toxic dusts. Um, there's no point going into them here. There's lots of literature about it. Um, I would imagine there would, there would quite likely be 24-hour 24 24 activity on Cullens Road um, with uh, asphalt okay, recycling got, I understand what you're saying. I'll, I'll address that with Mr Bogoff. So Do you need to make a concluding comment? Yes. We would like to see the area used as a perhaps a dog off leash area, a mountain bike area, perhaps a cafe or a park, similar to Mount Penang. Um, maybe other sporting or leisure activities. So we would ask that you please, please undertake community consultation with the people of Kingcumber and the surrounding suburbs. Okay. And I think understand what you're time. saying. Thank you very much. Um, do, you want to, we might go, uh, do you want to go to item 5.2 and deal with the items? I think it makes sense to do so. I think so. Yep. yep. Um, thank you, Mr. Administrator. Um, and thank you, Mr. Hughes. Uh, I, I think the, the, the... Excuse me, I'm getting messages here that I'm procedurally I may be in strength. Do I have to... I'll who's, pause. Who's putting the message? Do I have to go back and pass a resolution to do something? Or can I go straight to 5-2? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, certainly, the the yeah. Thank you for supporting the the recommendation and the future direction of the the site is is not um, finalised. That will be something that would come to back to council, Mr. Administrator. So, will there be cons consultation about yes. future use? Yes. Yep. There will be consultation with any any change. Um, it could be quite diverse um, in relation to the the. Can you can you advise advise me and therefore the community? Do you have a, a, a view of what's the most likely or, or the strongest case to be made for? The, the, the preliminary views and certainly discussions with staff is around um, more so what we were talking about earlier with stockpiling of material. So whilst that's on the, the road reserve now, this would be a location okay, so that, that would be suitable. So that is a possibility? That is a, a, a strong okay. possibility. If that, if that was to proceed, how, how close is that to the residents? Uh, it's... it's you know, several hundred metres that we'd be and, looking at. And uh, presumably with such a, a consideration, if it was to be approved, uh, there'd be uh, strong measures to, to stop dust and materials blowing from the site? That's right. And, and I think some of the concerns are probably more around a concrete crushing type arrangement, and I think that might be what um, the speaker was okay. talking about. Look, I, I think uh, from my point of view, uh, the main issue is going to come down the track. Where's Mr Hughes gone? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I lost you for a minute. Uh, the, the, the issue is uh, it's going to go to a public consultation process. 
uh, and there will be a council, either an administ another administrator or a council returned when it comes and you can make that case then. But thank you for raising it. I think if I was you, I'd be concerned uh, about it. And, and if I was going to not have a park or a cafe, I'd want all sorts of assurances. Uh, so uh, you'll have the chance to develop your strategy with your community uh, some time ahead. Mr. Bogov, when do you think this will likely go to public consultation? Uh, Mr. Administrator, it won't be for some months because we'd be looking at some other alternatives rather than okay. just this one. All right. Well, there is some time and uh, thank you for coming forward tonight. I've, I've been briefed on the report. I, I think it's heading in the right direction and uh, I move that resolution and uh, adopt that as a decision of Council. So I'm just uh, going to re return to my, uh, my running sheet. Uh, so I've, I've resumed uh, the ordinary uh, meeting, of course. Uh, in terms of item 1, one disclosures of interest, I have no conflicts of interest to declare, nor do any of the, uh, the directors around the table. Uh, and uh, I therefore receive the report of disclosure of interest and note there were no disclosures of interest. Confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting, I've read those and I believe they're a correct record. And I move that resolution and adopt that as a decision of council. Uh, item 1, three, notice of intention to deal with matters in closed session. There are. I will not be going into a closed session. I have read the reports. Uh, uh, there is commercial in confidence and I'm satisfied and I'll get to those when we, when we deal with them individually. Um, I now want to move, I've brought forward a, a number of administrators of minutes uh, tonight and they're now available on the website and there, I think there may be some hard copies out the back for those of you that want to, um, oh no, I've jumped ahead of well night of one four, are we? That's all right. Uh, this is a, a resolution to move uh, ordinary council meetings uh, to a Tuesday night from the past Monday night. I think it gives uh, everyone a little more time uh, and certainly for myself. So I don't think that'll have any negative effect on anyone and um, it will be take, held on Tuesdays effectively from the 9th of February. Uh, I forgot to point out that that's my birthday. We'll have to, have to change the rules again to suit me. <laughs> I move the resolution to have the first uh, Tuesday meeting on my birthday and uh, uh, appropriate sucking up will be appreciated. Uh, I adopt that as a decision of council. Um, okay, item 1.5 uh, is probably the, uh, the most significant issue of interest on the agenda tonight. And this is uh, my three monthly report uh, to residents. I produced a 30 day report. I called it interim because at the time I wasn't sure information was changing on me and things were still coming at me. As it turned out, not much more changed and uh, that will stand as the 30 day report and it will be attached to these. I would urge anyone who's actually going to get involved in these discussions to read both reports uh, because it's, um, uh, well, it's very easy to have an emotional response, but if it's not well informed, it's not much use to me. Um, but I am genuinely interested in hearing from people who have any alternative ideas. So uh, I'm not going to read the report into the record. Uh, it obviously talks about the fact that my term has been extended uh, by the Minister. The Council of Suspension has continued to the, another three months, that's to the 29th. Uh, the Minister uh, cannot do a further extension. So the Minister will have a decision to make whether the Council has come back at that time or whether uh, she seeks to utilise other powers that may take, uh, take another path. Uh, it's been incorrectly reported in the media that I support the council as coming back. I've never said that. I've just pointed out that that's, that's, that's how the system is, is shaped and that might well be an option. I haven't expressed a view one way or another, um, but uh, I'm developing one. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in terms of progress, uh, in the interim report, I talked about the strategies that we were, we were probably gonna have to look at. They're well underway. And we have borrowed the extra money we needed. If we had not got that loan, as I've mentioned before, we would not have been able to pay our staff and our creditors in January. Um, this is outrageous to be, to be in a situation like this. And the fact that Ms Cowley, Mr Hart and I celebrated the final message from a bank that they would agree to lend us $100 million is sad. I mean, the fact that I mean, we should never have been in this situation that we have to be pleased about borrowing $100 million. But the alternative was was back to insolvency and uh, to be frank, Mr Hart and I may well have turned the lights out and, <laughs> and <gone. laughs> we weren't going to operate insolvent. But uh, that didn't happen, we got the money, but a condition, not so much a condition of the loan, but the lender was only willing to lend us the money on being convinced that we had a plan. And the plan involved 
selling some assets to pay down our unacceptably high level of debt, that we would cut our costs, and we have done that. Uh, we have well advanced with uh, progressing a, a, a voluntary redundancy program, which will meet most of our targets. Uh, and that's a, that's a small bit of good news. Uh, people are choosing to go, so that means they're either nearing retirement or they're confident about their prospects of getting, a work, getting work in the community because of their, their skill and experience set. Uh, that may not be the whole group, but it's, it's looking like a pretty uh, strong response. Um, we have uh, also uh, progressed other cuts. Uh, we've cut the, the, the Unsustainable Capital Works program back from in the, in the two, 240 back to 170. Uh, and uh, the bottom line is we have a recurrent shortfall of around 70 million this year. And it'll be reported as 215 because we have, sorry, 115. 115 because we're going to have to find 45 million to pay out all the costs of the staff who are leaving the organisation. But the $70 million is, it's like if we did nothing else, made no changes, we'd lose $70 million every year from now on. In fact, it would increase because uh, staff wages would go up and we would uh, higher than uh, the CPI increase uh, to our rate revenue. Uh, that is not sustainable. It's just not possible. Uh, and the banks would not have uh, lent us the money. Uh, can I also say that there was another bank uh, to whom we owed over $100 million, that we spent over an hour on the phone convincing the risk committee uh, not to call the loan in. Okay, so just trying to give you an understanding of what the real world's like at this side of what we've been dealing with, uh, particularly in the in the few weeks uh, leading up to Christmas. Uh, part of the uh, equation that was needed, asset sales, cutting costs, uh, borrowings, was increasing revenue. Now, we would like to have not had to have a rate increase. No one wants a, a rate increase, and, and obviously it would never, was never going to be popular. But of that 70 million that we have to find, 25 or 26 million rather comes from a 15% rate, rate increase, should I part approve it. So we have lent heavily on the cost cutting side. We haven't led quickly on the hit the, some might say the easier side of, of raising money from, from rate pass. Um, it's, it's our view, and this is Mr Hart particularly, and Mr Ryan joins us, we have over 100 years experience in running large organisations and, and, and many councils, at least six and probably eight or nine if you had Mr Ryan's experience. We are of the view, as genuine experts in large organisations and councils, that to cut any deeper would probably cause irreparable damage to the organisation. You start to get to a level where you lose too much expertise and that critical mass starts to fall away. Uh, so we do not support cutting any deeper. So you can say, well, can you continue to run at a deficit of, of 25 million a year? The answer is no. We already, if we, if we did that, then those banks are gonna call in the money. And I said at one stage when there was a risk of this particular bank calling in over $100 million, I said, well, can, can we just refuse to pay? And the sad answer is they can actually go directly and take our rate revenues which was news to me, but, but uh, may, maybe not news to some of you if you're in the finance sector. But um, So we, we, people have to come to grips with the fact that this is, this is the real situation we're dealing with. So if, they're, if you're angry, um, go to the minister. If you're angry, go to the ballot box. But we are going to have to, in my view, have a rate increase. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a communication challenge to try and help people understand the situation we're in, uh, and I'll continue to do my best to do that. Uh, but we are well advanced to turn the organisation around, uh, and uh, we will have a, a small surplus next year, and surpluses thereafter for the next 10 years. Uh, and that's what's needed, and that was also a, a requirement. Uh, those surpluses over the next 10 years, and our calculations will, will generate uh, about 113 million and that will go to paying back those, some of those restricted reserves and, and reducing the debt. By the way, if interest rates go up, and many of you, in terms of the, the, the age you're at, uh, remember uh, interest rates are much, much, much higher, let alone double or triple. Double or triple would still be low interest rates for me, and that would be a really serious problem uh, for us with $565 million of debt. So. I just, the message to the community is you can't underestimate how dire this is. And if we could find more through cost cuttings and savings, we would. 
uh, we believe uh, that to have a viable ongoing organisation, uh, it's necessary to have extra revenue. Uh, I'm getting messages in my office, people concerned about potholes and, and complaints about grass getting longer. Quite a lot of them, um, they're coming into our system, we record our complaints. And I said to uh, my, uh, my staff the other day, have, have I done anything yet that's likely to have increased this or cut services here? The answers come back, no. The previous council took some measures. One of them was cut over time and the other was to um, uh, not fill vacancies. That's what, that's, they're the first signs of what those actions were and how they result in. Well, can I tell you, they don't even touch the sides compared to exiting 300 odd people out of the organisation and cutting the budgets that we've cut uh, to get to that. Is there some electronic perform going on here? Anyway, um, so uh, again, we don't feel it is sustainable. The detail is in this report and no doubt that we've, you'll hear me in the media tomorrow talking about it and, uh, and answering some of the questions. I've dealt with the question of the large payout to the former chief executive. I deal with issues why haven't the council has been sacked. I deal with issues about why the executive still in their jobs. Uh, please uh, read that. I've, I've, I've uh, addressed the issue of if the restricted reserves use was unlawful, why hasn't it been referred to ICAC? I'm not going to go through all of those things now, but it's there and I'll be out there in the media explaining that. Uh, the, when the government merged councils, they came up with a model involving 15 councillors in five wards. Um, most of us who have been around for a while thought that's going to be really hard. They did it for political reasons and politicians do that. There's no surprise there, but they obviously wanted to make each of the merged entities feel they were still represented locally. It creates an, uh, 15 is too big. I mean, the, the main function of a council is to run a very big uh, business organisation, obviously representing the interests of the community. But the 15 people model is quite, quite often turning into a parliament, often seven, eight, uh, and there tends to be contest on every issue, political point scoring on every issue. Um, and uh, if you haven't been to previous council meetings, go to the website and look at some of the meetings. Uh, the, the webcast, this is all being recorded. You can access any meeting and go and have a look at it if you need to be convinced. And I'd say to those of you that tune in tonight, and that's probably going to be uh, 500 to 1,000 over, over time, uh, if you haven't seen the meetings, go and have a look at some of the behaviour of the councillors. Now, um, I believe a much more workable number is nine. And so I'm proposing tonight, uh, and it'll be the next thing I deal with after this report, to bring a referendum uh, to the community at the next election to reduce the number of councillors from 15 to nine. Um, I believe that'll have strong support. A question associated with that is the ward structure. Um, and I'm going to consult the community on the options here. Uh, the options are no wards at all, an undivided council. I personally support that because I think you want all nine of those people to feel responsible for the whole area and to make decisions as a whole rather than what can I get for my ward and, and that sort of mentality. But not everyone shares that view. Um, if you're going to have nine councillors, then you have to have equal number of wards, so you'd go to three wards on that model. Um, and if you want to stay at five and 15 councillors, that option will be there for you to in the consultation. So that'll be organised almost immediately and that consultation will go over. Uh, I will prepare a referendum. Uh, I'll make those decisions after I've considered the feedback from the community on the ward structure and uh, that will go to the next election. Unfortunately, a referendum change doesn't take effect till the election after. So it's actually three and a half years after September or so before or three years after until that would, would take effect. I believe it, it won't guarantee success, uh, but I believe it increases the chances of success. So I mentioned that, that this fairly big thing that's coming uh, out tonight and uh, will be in the media uh, tomorrow. Um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, you will be able to see fairly soon in real time, you'll be able to go onto the internet and you'll be able to look at the, the financial situation for each of the directorates and the council as a whole and how they're performing against their budget on a monthly basis. So there will be a uh, huge transparency that's not been available uh, and uh, hopefully uh, people will take some confidence in that. The other piece uh, that's really important to report on is the recruitment of a new chief executive. Uh, I do feel that, uh, uh, that the previous chief executive um, didn't perform uh, adequately in terms of financial management or leadership. Um, and. Um, 
uh, I made that, that fairly hard decision uh, to let him go in the way I did. But um, I did that in part, as I said before, the most important thing now for this organisation, in my view, is to get a new chief executive in place, uh, someone who has run a uh, large council and someone who can handle a fairly difficult job, particularly if councillors return. Local government chief executive, in my view, is one of the harder jobs in the public sector because you're balancing this this issue between the responsibility to the council and also the responsibility to the community running a large organisation. Uh, Mr Hart and I, along with another person, an experienced local government person, will be interviewing. And we'll only, we're only going to look at people who've done the job uh, before and have done it well. So I'm very confident that that piece in place, in, in, and my target is early April. Remember, I leave on the 29th of April. Uh, that will be put in place. Uh, if the councillors are coming back, uh, then I'll be recommending to the minister that uh, she, um, uh, she appoint Mr Hart as a financial controller. It's another power that she has under her act, and that basically means he makes the financial decisions. The council can't change the financial decisions that are, that are in place. Uh, and that's another level of protection that the community would have in the event that that scenario is followed. And um, that, uh, that brings me, I suppose, to a conclusion. Um, I'm uh, pleased to present the report. Uh, I think it also is, is, uh, passes my test of plain English. And I hope people will have a chance to read it. And a message. If you come to me with alternatives, I'll listen to them. But if you tell me you haven't read the report, then we're not going to have a conversation. I mean, it's really important if you want to get in the community to at least uh, show uh, show me the respect of, of informing yourself before we talk, not to just get emotional and start yelling at me out the front about you know, how, uh, you know... Anyway, I won't repeat some of the comments. I failed my own test tonight. I have a test of staying calm in all situations, and I didn't pass my test tonight. I actually lost it with a couple of these people, and I'm, I'm sure that's what the TV will pick up and focus on. And I'm, I might have actually called someone a jerk. It's possible. I, I can't remember. Uh, but he was. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I look forward to uh, having responses to this, uh, and I move the recommendation there accordingly. <laughs> Now, I just foreshadowed the uh, proposal to have the uh, uh, referendum. Uh, there's a, a submission uh, before us on that, and uh, I, I've explained it. Again, it's, it's not a guarantee uh, of better performance, but I think it significantly increases the chance that we might get a, a body that works together more harmoniously. And I'm sorry uh, former Councillor Best isn't, didn't stay for, for this part of it, um, former councillor Best was one of the more knowledgeable members of the council. He's been in Wyong for a long time. I mean, it, it was cheeky for him to come along here and tell me how hard it is to have a rate increase on the, the people in his area when he admitted in the same breath that he'd done the same uh, as the, <laughs> in Wyong. But anyway, uh, uh, the average rate in Wyong, if this 15% increases, will go down $3 a week. Okay, it would have gone down a bit more than that if, uh, with harmonisation if we hadn't had the increase. But, uh, but and, and that's an average. Higher value properties will be more or less, and lower value properties likewise. So the people he's talking about will often actually be getting possibly four or five dollars a week less rates. But nevertheless, um, the, the previous councils, if you didn't look at them, tune in. Uh, it was very combative, not very collaborative, not very cooperative. Uh, and um, uh, um, people like uh, Mr. Best, who yes, he raised concerns about the financial situation passed, resol moved resolutions, which weren't successful. Um, I saw him on a media the other day saying, he, he, I think it was 50 or 70, at a list of them all. And I would have liked to have talked to him, and I will talk to him at some point, about, well, if they weren't successful, what's the point of just doing it again? I mean, there's no point being a, what I'd call a resolutionary. That, that doesn't help anything. What, what was needed was to reach across the aisle and make and form relationships and work with people, other councillors, and try and work together in the interest of the whole community and had that been done. So I'm not blaming him individually, but I'm certainly not going to sit by and let him say, well, I did my bit, I pointed out there was a problem. Uh, his, his style of operating contributed to the problem and as part of that governing body, uh, he contributed to the sad outcome. But uh, yes, all of the councillors, uh, in my view, did not adequately meet the challenge that was laid out for them in the Local Government Act. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they're all reflecting on that. Uh, I also know to use, I think it was, was it Paul Keating that said the electorate was waiting for someone with baseball bats? Well, um, I, uh, of course, that's not literally, uh, but, but metaphorically, and I suspect there's anger out there that will be interesting to, to see manifest. So I'm going to bring this referendum on, 
I'm going to consult with the community about w what sort of ward structure uh, they want, and then I'll go uh, put that set that referendum up, which will take place in the next election. In the event that there's not an election uh, in September for this council, which is one of their scenarios, uh, there can still be a referendum. And I did that in Warringah Council, actually. It had a, a much lower turnout than you might like, because if people are going to go and vote for council, they're not necessarily going to go and vote in a referendum. But it still had a good turnout. I think it was over 60%. And um, that, that, so that, that will occur here. But again, it won't occur until another three years. I move that resolution and adopt that as a decision of council. Okay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, I'm going to go fairly quickly through the remaining items. We've heard from people on them. Uh, I've been briefed upon them and I've had my chance to satisfy myself. So don't mistake uh, expediting through this stage uh, is that I'm not paying attention or asking hard questions. Um, so we go to, <coughs> excuse me again. So item two one is working together, staying COVID strong grants. Um, I've read the report and I'm satisfied with it. Uh, Ms Vaughan, do you want to add anything to it? Nothing major, Mr Administrator. This is just the report on grants that have already been allocated um, under this funding program. Okay, I'll note the report and the recommendation there. I move that and adopt that as a decision, Council. <coughs> Item 2.2, two, uh, Chain Valley Colliery Delta Coal Community Funding Program. Ms Vaughan. Uh, Mr Administrator, these are the grant um, funding applications um, on behalf of the advisory group for the um, this particular vet voluntary planning agreement, so um, nothing Thank to you. identify. I, I support the uh, recommendation and uh, the good work that's been done here. I move that recommendation and adopt that as a decision of Council. Uh, item three, one is the business recovery plan. Ms. Cal, you've made a few comments already. Do you want to add anything further? Uh, no, thanks, Ms. Administrator. <coughs> I think okay, it's all then covered. In that case, sorry, you finished? Yes. Uh, the reports on the record, I note that uh, adopt the amended policy. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Frog, they call it. Um, okay, uh, the, I move that, uh, if I didn't already, I move that uh, motion and adopt that as a decision of council. Item 3.3 is the meeting records advisory group. Um, I note your comments uh, earlier. I'll have a look at it, but um, I'm happy with the report. I move that recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. Item 3.4 is the investment report. Ms Cowling. Uh, thank you, Mr Administrator. <laughs> This report um, highlights that um, we've had $17 million uh, reduction in the investment portfolio for the month of December um, due to um, working capital, capital requirements. But at the same time, we've also had a, an increase in the cash, cash in hand as a result of receiving the loan, uh, which brings us finally to a situation that um, our unrestricted funds as at the 30th of December 2020 uh, finally look uh, the right way, way of the equation and they are positive rather than a uh, negative number. And adopt that as a decision of council. Uh, item 4.1 is the meeting of the records of Catchman Coast Committee meetings. Uh, I don't think there's anything to add here. Mr Cox is there? Thank you. I've moved the recommendations and adopt those as a decision of council. Item 4.2 is the request for amendment planning proposal of Mulloway Road, Chain Valley Bay. Mr Cox. Uh, through you, Mr Administrator. Um, it's a, a current planning proposal that staff are uh, assessing. The only change is the incorporation of an R2 low density zone as part of the proposal. And the reason for that amendment is to, en to enable the permissibility of an existing dwelling on site and also to, to overcome some minimum lot size issues should, you, um, should they need to uh, rezone okay. the RA2 piece. Thank you very much. Uh, I move that rec 
resolution or that motion and adopt that as a decision of council. It's getting quite warm in here. Um, have we been paying our electricity bills? <laughs> we haven't run out of Maybe. <laughs> run out of money to that extent. I can't feel the econ being very effective. Um, okay, item 4.3, outcomes of the consultation on the draft smoke-free outdoor public places policy. Mr Cox, this is a, a nice, nice thing for me to see. Uh, um, three, Mr Administrator. Yes, we put the, uh, the draft policy out on exhibition. We received six submissions. Um, most uh, of the submissions were, were trying to go beyond the, uh, the legislation in terms of uh, distances, which, which we can't control or change. But however, where we can control is extending the policy so it extends to all community land. So it now includes parks, play spaces, all community-based land to, to keep them smoke-free. And also, too, from our natural assets to um, to prevent other risks such as bushfires and things like that. And it does cover playgrounds, doesn't it? Correct. Uh, I'm proud to say that I was the second council in New South Wales to take such measures to stop smoking on beaches and parks and playgrounds. And I only was second because I felt I, had, I shouldn't be first because I wasn't elected as an administrator. So I waited for Manly Council to do it. And then uh, the next week I, I did it. I totally support the policy. I think it has strong community support. And uh, I congratulate those uh, working on it and those who made submissions. I move the recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. <coughs> that was in 2000 and, uh, about 2005, I think, or 2006, it was a long time ago. Um, item 4.4 is the cost of emergency works at Wombrel and the entrance to North Beach. Uh, this is a, an ongoing sore and problem. Mr Cox, can't you fix Wombrel? <laughs> <laughs> Working on it, Mr. Administrator. Um, uh, Mr. Administrator, uh, the, uh, the the intention of the council report was in response to a council resolution which uh, wanted an update on the uh, overall cost uh, of the emergency work spent at North Entrance Beach and at uh, Womberall. Uh, the total cost was just shy of $2.9 million. Uh, to date, council has received through grant funding 900 we, 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 our grant application was successful for $992,000. We're still waiting for the money to be deposited. Um, however, we were successful with that. Um, and the intention of the, uh, the follow-up recommendations is, is that the um, community identify the amount that council did spend as part of those emergency works, which were not budgeted uh, funds, um, and they, were, they had to be spent as part of the emergency works declared by the uh, local emergency controller. Um, and secondly, that if, if we are unsuccessful with, with uh, the recoupment of those funds, that the, uh, it gets acknowledged that uh, that money be used as a credit for any future works at either North Entrance Beach or at uh, Womborough. So if we, do, if we are successful, we use that money as a credit? No, no. If we're unsuccessful in getting further money, that oh, it's acknowledged that that, yeah, that money, okay. money already spent is a credit on any future yeah, okay. works. I've got it. Thank you very much. Uh, what do you think our prospects are of getting the further money? Um, just from feedback to date, unlikely. Shame. Okay. Well, you might can discuss with me possible strategies and maybe with uh, the Parliamentary Secretary for the area, uh, Adam Crouch, can help us there. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. I move that recommendation and adopt that as a decision of Council. Item 4.5 is request of prior planning proposal for Jubilee Stage 2 Rural Res Area. I visited this area in one of my early tours to get to know the area better with Mr Cox. Uh, I support the recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. Um, item 4.6 is the policy for development application functions. Uh, I've been briefed on this uh, and uh, there's increasingly good work being done to make it easier uh, to process applications. Uh, some people don't want it to be easier depending on the nature of the development, but particularly uh, uncomplicated developments should be made easier and that's happening and uh, the wait times are, are quite impressive. I move the recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. Uh, there's a, item 47 is the revocation of a number of council policies. Uh, I've been briefed on those. There's no one uh, spoken of concern about this resolution. I think it's straightforward <coughs> and I move that uh, recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. Item 5.1 is the Central Coast Stadium final strategy report. You can stay there, Mr Bolgoff. Um, I've read the report. I'm not that happy uh, with elements of it. A key part of uh, <coughs> the stadium strategy is the relationship with the Mariners 
It requires an anchor tenant. Uh, I've met with the anchor tenant <coughs> and there are things that they are looking for us to expedite to try and make their business uh, better and get more people better uh, there and make their experience better. The dates for <coughs> uh, excuse me, achieving some of those things at 2023 in December and December 22, that's too long away. Uh, there's a common sense in some of it because there's, some of it involves the development of a broader Gosford Town Centre uh, strategy, but some of these things have to be shelled out, I think, in advance. And so I've asked, uh, I'm going to move that the matter be deferred to allow Mr Bolgoff and Mr Hart and I to, <coughs> and Mr Ryan to work on it and see if we can make some, uh, make some improvements to it. So I move uh, that the matter be deferred uh, until... Uh, um, oh, another three meetings, about six weeks, or I think will give us the time to do that. <coughs> okay. I move that resolution and adopt that as a decision of council. Uh, Mr. Bolgoff's dealt with the, uh, or we've dealt with the Kincumber Waste Management Facility closure. Item 6 1, tender evaluation, Adelaide uh, Street Oval, Kalani Vale, New Amenities Building. Um, this is a story of uh, tenders not coming in to meet our, our expected price and then we've got some more money to do further stages so it's a question of going back uh, to get new new quotes. Uh, I've, um, I've got some experience as the head of the uh, Department of Public Works and Services for eight years. I've, tendering's been a, a fairly something I've developed a bit of expertise about even though I'm an arts graduate. <coughs> So I'm going to let this through, <coughs> but I've also asked the, um, <coughs> the Chief Executive uh, to uh, commission a review of our procurement, because I believe there's probably uh, one of those rocks you should turn over from time to time. I'm sure our people do well, but it was my experience as the Head of Department of Public Works and Services <coughs> that uh, there's definitely room for improvement, and in our current financial situation, any low-hanging fruit would be would be very welcome, and so Mr. Hart uh, has indicated he'll uh, he'll uh, proceed with such a review. I move the recommendation recommendation and adopt that as a decision of council. Final uh, what sec penultimate item is the Kibbleplex Kibbleplex parking station lease. Mr. Bolgoff, I think you need to come and talk to this one. I certainly can't. <coughs> oh yeah, shall try that. I'm getting an anti coal. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Administrator. Essentially, the Kibbleplex lease is um, up for renewal. Um, this is a, about 650 car parking spaces in that complex. That complex isn't being utilised. Um, it's only at about 60% or so um, utilisation. Um, we have alternate sites, um, such as the Gosford car park, which is running at about 20% utilisation. Um, there's also Adcock Park car parking, um, as well as um, Racecourse Road car park, and there's about 400 spaces there. So the proposal is to um, cease the lease in March of this year. Um, so that will obviously bring some financial benefit back to, to council. There's also some structural um, elements there that are being monitored um, on a monthly basis. Um, and there's also an approval for that site to progress. So um, that could happen with the 60 days notice um, from um, the, the owners of the site. So recommendations are to um, ensure that the uh, users of the car park do get adequate notice. And that's why we're looking at, at closing in March and there'll be appropriate notification to the users. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy with the uh, recommendations. I move those and adopt those as a decision of council. Last item on the agenda is uh, 6.3, Peninsula Leisure Centre Heating and Ventilation and Air Conditioning and Replacement. Um, I'm, no, you can say I'm happy... Uh, Ms. Warren, I'm happy with the recommendation, which I, I move and adopt that as a decision of council. That brings me to the end of the meeting. I declare the meeting closed.
Uh, thank you for staying and listening, and I uh, look forward to talking to some of you uh, after the meeting and in the future. Thanks very much.